um, the verse. Okay, this is a verse that we're going to retail. I'm gonna re I think this is an uh, NIV. Okay, the theme is born again part two. That's it, just born again part two. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's room to be born. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, Lord. You're a good, kind, faithful, just, and holy. We ask you, Lord, that you just bless this day. Clarity of thought and speech, Lord. We ask prayers for Sister Linda right now, that you minister to her. Touch her where she's at, Lord Jesus. Touch her right now in Jesus' name. Lord, release your healing. Lord. You said we can ask in your name. So we're asking in your name. Lord Jesus, do this work for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Comfort pastor right now. Give him strength, Lord Jesus. Comfort the family. They're going through some trying times right now, Lord Jesus. You know, pastor just lost his brother. But, Lord, you're going to comfort, Lord. You're going to comfort Brother Alvarez, his father, um, Brother Vicente. You're going to bless the, the children. We're going to ask right now, Lord, that you just minister in Jesus' name to this family. And for those of us that are down in spirit, lift us up. Those that are here that are sick in spirit, sick, heal us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seat. Okay, I got this on. Right. Amen. Go ahead. Just keep on the picture, Dylan. Amen. I, I want, like the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Um, when I talked on this verse the last time that I spoke, you know, I was talking how Nicodemus came at night. And, you know, when I was brought up in church or when I was going to Sunday school, they have always portrayed Nicodemus being a coward because he came at night. But, you know, one day I was reading it and I was trying to just go through it. And, you know, God revealed something to me. The reason why he went at night is because all men are at night. All men are in darkness. If you don't have Jesus, you're not in the light. And, and that's the truth. You, 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 you might see um, silhouettes of what you think is out there, but really you're dark. It's because you're dead. And, you know, what I mean by death is it's because sometimes we, in today's society, have a misconception what is death. Some people believe that when you die, you cease to exist, and, and we don't teach that. We don't believe that. We believe when a person dies, that that person, if he did what scripture says, he'll spend eternity with God. But if the person did not do what scripture says, then he's waiting for judgment, the lake of fire. You know, we all try to scare you with hell, but actually the way it works out is hell's like a holding tank. Hell, it, look, have you ever read scripture where, where it talks about hell, what it means by it? Go with me to Matthew if you have your Bibles or look on your phones. Go to Matthew 25, Matthew 25. And in Matthew 25, let me see if I can find it. I always laugh because there was um, sometimes when you find the verse, and then now when I need the verse, now the verse wants to hide itself. So let's go to Matthew 25, and we're going to look at verse 41. Verse 41. Then said he also unto them, On the left hand, depart from me. Ye are cursed into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. So if you go to hell, you're going there as an invited guest. You know, um, when I was a young man, I wanted to join the Navy. And, and the reason why I wanted to join, because my dad was in the Navy. And, um, you know, I was just out of high school and I was going to go. But my, my dad took me to the side. And he says, son, when I was your age or, you know, 
it was World War II. And um, I enlisted. I enlisted. And, um, you know, I didn't have to enlist, but I, I put myself in harm's way because at that time I felt our country was calling me, calling us, and I, I went and answered to the call of my country. Now, my dad was from Colorado. So if you can understand um, where my dad lived was very rural, then they were, you know, poor, poor people that lived there. Now there's multi-million dollar homes there. So I kind of wish that my dad had never left Colorado, but where they live at is called Piscosa Springs, and it's a, it's a ski town now. So it's a million-dollar town up there in, in the Rockies. And, um, but my dad told me, he said this, son, if Uncle Sam sends you a letter, then go. But if Uncle Sam doesn't send you a letter and they wish you good luck, that means you're going to die. And I, I thought about that. And that's right. You know, Uncle Sandy didn't send me a letter, Sister Anna. So why was I going to put myself in harm's way? Now, I'm not saying that the military is bad. All I'm saying, if I would have just enlisted like my father didn't want me to, and then I would have been, say, called out to war, because at that time there was Grajeda and the different little combat, combat situations. And if I was out there... And if I would have died, it wasn't the country's fault that I died. It wasn't because the enemy shot at me that I died, Sister Martha. You know whose fault it is? It's my fault because I went somewhere where I wasn't invited. I went myself. And see, that's what hell is. You're not supposed to go there. Hell wasn't made for man. Hell was made for the devil and his angels his demons. So if you go there, you're going as an uninvited guest. And it's a place of torment and darkness. Now, you need to understand that. God doesn't send us to hell. You go because you didn't take the invitation. Now, there's two invitations here. There's an invitation to hell and there's now there's an invitation to a new life. Because I think it's kind of um, fraudulent when we say, well, if you give your heart to the Lord, heaven is your home. And it is, in a sense, but our, our salvation is more than I got my ticket punch, and if I die, then I can just walk up to heaven and just give him a ticket. No, something happens in the individual, and this is Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus was moral in a sense is that he was uh, practicing of uh, all that was required of Judaism. And then in his day, like, you know, today we have conservative and liberals. He was a conservative Jew. So he was a Jew that practiced everything that was required, required in Scripture and even more. So here you have a moral man. Here you have a good man. Here you have a man that knows scripture, but yet when he confronts Jesus Christ, he doesn't come to Jesus Christ with, he tries to come to Jesus Christ with his morality or his goodness. In reality, Jesus has to talk to him and says, no, look it. Nicodemus said, I'm a teacher, you're a teacher. And, and, and Jesus says, no, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You need to be born again. And, and, you know, growing up in church, you would think I would have known what this term was being born again. But it never dawned on me until I got older because sometimes when I was a child, someone said, oh, you're a born again Christian. And I would scratch my head and say, well, because sometimes we didn't talk like that. You know, brother, I'm being brought up in church. Sometimes there's terms that, personal savior. No one ever said that growing up. If you grew up in our church, there was nothing about personal about Jesus. It was public. It was, you were all in. It, there was no private, private sister Dolores. No, we weren't private about it. We, when we were, gave our hearts to the Lord, and I don't even know a sister Dolly I remember, back in the day, the young people, they, you, you would find us with the Bible. They, we were, I'd be as old as my boys right here, 
But if I had to go to high school or if I would, I would have my Bible. You know, it was just a different time that we were living in. So down there, the, you know, you didn't just look a certain way on Sunday. It was 24-7 because we believe that when God did work inwardly, that that same work was going to be displayed outwardly. But this is where sometimes we get wrong at. It says that God does do a work inwardly, but we think we can perfect ourselves by doing things outwardly, and we can't. This experience that God wants to give you, he wants you to become alive and aware what he has for you. And before you can have anything from God, you got to have a change inward before it can show outward. You know, I've read the scripture. It says that God would bless you spirit, holy, your, your, your mind, your soul, holy, and, and, and your body. That, that there would be a change inwardly instead of outwardly. And I think sometimes we get it reversed and we try to work on our body. We try to work on our mind. But actually, our spirit suffers because when God deals with you, he doesn't deal with your brain. He deals with the heart. Because remember what I said, when you find these bodily organs in scripture, it's talking about the spirit of man. It's talking about the inner man. And that's why a lot of us struggle because some of us, we try to live to, for God through legalism. We think, all the keys, I think they're right there. You know, 100 people saw this. I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know how she's going to take that out. Anyway, um, they try to live for God through their flesh. And you know those Christians. We don't do this, and we don't do that. And instead of showing compassion, and, and this is a true story, and it bothers me to this day. There was a young girl when we were in San Pedro. She was riding by the church on her bike. And I, I asked her, you know, uh, who invited you? She says, I walked by your church, but the Lord told me to come in. And then I'm thinking, okay, listen, just because we say God talks to you, you know, you, you think people are crazy because it's, well, he does talk to us, but... You know, she just, well, God talked to me. Okay, cool. Well, I'll come in. Well, you know, before you know it, everything that could be said that was done, she gave her heart to the Lord that day. I baptized her. And normally we don't do that, but, you know, out of, we just brought her. She came off the street. She went in our church dry, and she went home wet on her bike. And God did a wonderful work in her life. The next week, her boyfriend had got out of um, jail, and he came with her. And you know, before you could say one plus one is two, I was baptizing him. And I was praising the Lord. So she brought in her boyfriend. She's going to church now. And then next week, they let her bring her daughter to the church. So her daughter wasn't there. So, you know, I'm feeling great now. We have three people that different experience in life that don't know anything about church, really don't know nothing about God. And then she went to church one day early and two old saints from our old church told her, well, didn't they tell you you're not supposed to wear this and you're not supposed to do that? And she never came back to church. You cannot serve God in your flesh. Now, I'm not against our standards. I believe in them. I've looked like, like a crayon for 41 years of my life. But if it's going to send people to hell, then to hell with the standards. Because God doesn't start with your outside. God has to start with your spirit. And you know, it bothers me today because I remember how excited she was when God got a hold of her. Look at, not all of us are on the same sheet. 
None of you are going to be like Brother Dan. I've been in this 41 years of my life, and I have 41 years of experience living for God. Some good, some bad. But when it became real to me, when I was in 10 years, and when I realized that it wasn't my outside that it was important, it was my spirit. God dealt with my spirit. And because he dealt with my spirit, then that's when everything changed. He got to work on your, then he got to work on your mind. Because some of you don't know how to think with a born again worldview or a Christian worldview. You know, you live for God in your spirit, but the problem is you try to live with your mind. Now, the soul part of you, which is kind of funny, the reason why your soul is eternal is because it's connected to your spirit. If you read in Hebrews, you remember how pastor says it, that the word of God is more powerful than a two-edged sword. It can divide asunder the spirit and the soul because it's kind of funny. Anything that has life in it, from a cricket to a grizzly bear, they have a soul. They have a soul. But have you ever noticed something Animals are not eternal. Why aren't animals not eternal if they have a soul? Because when it says in Adam, well, think, brother Dan, let me just ask you a question. Philosophical Dan right now. When God breathed breath into Adam, it said that Adam became a living soul. You know what's the difference between animals and us? Even though they want to make us an animal, is because we're made in the image of God. And we have a spirit. And our spirit either will spend eternity with our creator or will spend it separate. And that's what death is. Death just means separation. If you choose God and let God give you his eternal life, then he puts you in a position where you can live with him in eternity. But if you don't receive God's eternal life, even though you're dead spiritually, you're dead, you'll be separated from God for eternity. The problem is we don't cease to exist. Jesus Christ died, not for you that you could go to heaven. Jesus Christ died because he didn't want you to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And if you go to the lake of fire or you end up in the lake of fire, you're going there as an uninvited guest because God made a way for us through the cross, through Jesus Christ. You in yourself can never merit God's favor. Favor comes from God by grace, are you saved through faith and not of yourself? Why? It's a work of God. Why? Because in our past life, how we used to live our life, we lived it according to the course of this world, according to the God of this system. But when Jesus Christ came to us, he enlightened us, he opened our eyes, and he gives us the ability that we can choose him. See, this is the problem with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is trying to work it out in the flesh. And that's why a lot of us stumble, because we have a misconception, why did Jesus Christ came? What is this salvation? When you, you hear about today, I'm going to give you three groups, okay? There's Pentecostals, and that's where we fall under. There's full gospel, and there's word of faith, okay? You have three groups. You think they would all be the same, but they're different. Pentecostals believe you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You need the gift of the speaking in tongues. It's an essential. Where in the full gospel, it's not an essential. You, you might believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You might believe the word of God and all the promises, but you don't make that emphasis on that baptism, receiving that baptism. You're just good enough if someone raised their hand and says, I believe, and they could sit on your pews for 40 years 
and not and I have no more experience than a flea. You know, where you go to a Pentecostal church, they want you to have this experience, which is good that you should have the experience, but we don't live our life on just an experience. Our life should be based on a life of faith. Where you get the word of faith now, even though they believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but it's different with them. They believe that we shouldn't be poor, that we should live in prosperity. Now, all of them preach a true, but all of them don't practice the true in the same way. You have one that says, okay, if you have this experience, the other one says, no, if you have this experience, but the other one says, no, you got to have a born again experience. You have to have a work inwardly because you just can't serve God on your mind. There are Christians, they are moral and they're intellectual and they say the right things. They know the terminology, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have a relationship with books in theology. They have a relationship in listening to famous preachers. They have a relationship. They know how to act in church. But when death comes or, or, or tragedy strikes, they don't know how to live because they've lived through the eyes of the law. You know, it's not wrong reading the scriptures. It's not wrong hearing good preaching. But the Bible says that the letter kill it. If you only live by this, by reading it academically, you're going to end up in the wrong place because this book is spirit and it's life. It has to produce life in you. It has to produce an eternal life that wants to, you to live with your Father in heaven. You can't pick and choose in Scripture. You can't pick and choose in your salvation. Either Christ did a work or he didn't. Now, look it. Go with me to Corinthians. For, go to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians, let's go to uh, Okay, yeah, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter five and verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. So this, this is the love of God. Jesus Christ died for us. And the reason why he died for us, because we were all dead. The life that we receive, we receive Christ's life. Now, listen to me. This is just simple. This is, this is how simple it is. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us are sinners. Remember, your problem is not the fruit. The problem is the root. All of you have the ability to produce bad fruit, but all the fruits are not the same. For some of you, the fruit was alcoholism. For some of you, it was lying. For some of you, it was being um, hateful. But when Christ came, when Christ came to your life and you heard the word of God for the first time and you were aware that it wasn't you but that it was him, the ax is laid not at the fruit but at the root of the tree and he cuts it down. So that tree a bad fruit shouldn't exist in your life. You know why? Because he plants a new, fruit, a new tree in the place of the old tree. Now, now look at this. Christ, and look it, and he died for all, that they which should live, not henceforth live unto themselves, 
but unto him which died for them and rose again. Because Jesus Christ died, then you should live for him. You can't live for yourself. And see, this is where we live in society. Everyone wants to live for themselves. No, you have to live for Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus died for you. And because he died for you, that's the, you're not doing this because of this building. You're not doing it because of Pastor Alvarez or Brother Dan. You're doing this because you had an encounter with the God of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. And the reason why you're different, it's not because you're trying to be good. It's not reform. It's transformation. It has to be something to happen on the inside. It doesn't happen in your brain. You know, that's what I told you last week when we sang that little song. When I was little, we used to say, come into my heart. But there are people who say, come into my head. If it's up here and it's not in here, you might know it up here. If it's not in here, it has to be personal. It has to be inside of you. And sometimes we make the mistake that we think if we don't do this or we don't do that, no, no. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It said because of one man's sin, all men became sinners. And we are sinners not because of what we do. We are sinners because that's what we are. We sin. And the reason why we come to church, because the word of God is preached. And when the word of God is preached, it's alive and it's a living. And it quickens us. And that's what God does in Jesus Christ in our life. He quickens us. He gives us the ability to make that decision. He gives us the ability to make that choice. He gives us, you know why? Because we lost something in the garden. Now, you might not all agree with me, but I always hear this term, we have free will. And, and in, in a sense, we do. We have where we can make decisions in our lives. But when I think it comes to scripture, God has to quicken us for us to respond to God. If God doesn't quicken you, then how can you respond to God? Because a lot of people respond intellectually, but their heart is far from what God wants them to be. They know God, but when they talk about him, it's rules and regulations. And it shouldn't be rules and regulations. It should just be grace. It should be something that says, despite my failures, God loves me. Despite how I feel about myself, despite of my upbringing, despite of the tragedies that happened in my life, I know that there's someone one day will wipe away all tears. One day there will be no more death. One day there will be no sickness. And if I respond to that call, I know that day he's going to take me and he's going to explain to me what happened in this life. You know, some of us were casual, uh, was it? Casual, um, there was a collateral, collateral damage. That's what it is. You know, um, there's a, it was a movie by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and what I remember about it was is that um, they killed his family. They didn't kill him, and it was because of what he was doing in the government. So, they, so his family reaped his punishment, what he did for the government, and they killed his family. That's collateral. That's collateral damage. And that's how, what happened. When Adam sinned, we all suffer the consequences in our lives because of sin. You know, sin is ugly. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't really understand what happened in Michigan, but apparently this young boy went to school. They told the parents 
The parents didn't do nothing where I think the school should have sent them home. They left them at school, and then at the end of the day, that young boy ended up killing three people, four people. Now, how, they, 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 they knew something was wrong. They, 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 the, so now, because the boy committed these murders, they're charging the parents. Why? Because they wouldn't make a decision? Hey, I think my boy needs to see a psychiatrist. I think my boy needs to be locked up here. But no. Now they're suffering, and even though they didn't pull the trigger, when they're going to go to court, if the boy gets life, don't think they're going to get a, 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 a couple of years added to their lives. They're suffering the con and that's sin. That's what sin does. Sin comes and destroys. That's what the devil does. The devil comes to kill, steal, destroy. If you live your life apart from Jesus Christ, that's all you have coming. If you live according to the course of this world, it's death, it's theft, and it's separation from God. And that's why you need to be born again. And this is the what Nicodemus doesn't understand. He's trying to approach it morally, but you got to see it spiritually. Now, let's, let's finish this off. Let's finish this off. It says, Wherefore, henceforth we know, we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, and henceforth now we know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Or does it say? He, old things are passed away, Behold, all things become new, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not impugning their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the world word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though through Christ, God did receive you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. And that's all I'm doing. I'm saying you need to be connected to God. That's what reconciling. You don't need to be connected to the building. You don't need to be reconnected to the pastor. You need to be connected to Jesus Christ. You need to be connected to him. And then look what he does in verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's how I figured, that's how the Lord revealed it to me one day. Jesus died on the cross, not for his sins, because he had no sins. He died on the cross for our sins. And because he died on the cross for our sins, he exchanges, he takes our sins and he gives us his nature or his righteousness. So actually, the way you can look at righteousness is that I'm right. I'm right before God because of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing in myself that I can do to get me more right. You're already spiritual. Why do you, this is where we go wrong. Well, if I fast three days and I pray five nights, then I'm going to be close. You're close to God already if you have him inside of you. You're always looking for an experience. You're always looking for visions. You're looking for voices. And you have the living word of God where you can read it for yourself and have the witness of God's assurance Wait before your eyes. Your evidence is the word of God. Your evidence is this true. I don't care what experience you have. I don't care if you saw lights when you came to the water. But if you're living like the devil, don't expect heaven to be your home. Because it's not in an emotion. It's in fact. Praise the Lord. Am I on? Yes, I am. 
It's not on emotion. It's on facts. You can't be living for God on your emotions. You got to live on God what the word of God says. It is the words of God. You know, have you ever wondered about Jesus Christ when he confronted the devil? Let's go with, my, uh, go with me to the Bible. Um, I mean to Matthew. See if I can find it. Go to Matthew chapter 4, I believe. And now, I need to be clear here, all right? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. But in this passage, even though Jesus Christ is God, Jesus Christ is also a man. He's fully God and fully man. So he has a divine and a human nature in one person. The person is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, whatever it is God is spiritually, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. To see Jesus is to see God. All right? Understand that. All right? But in this passage, when Jesus deals with the devil, he doesn't deal from his divine part because if Jesus did it from the divinity, then how can we win, Jackie? Because he's God. God never loses. So when Jesus is confronted with the devil here, how's he confronted, Sister Dahlia? He's confronted as a man. So read the scripture with me. Let's look at Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is God. Brother Dan's not saying he's not God. But right here, Jesus Christ is God and man. You always sing the song, don't we? Don't we call him Lion and the Lamb? Isn't that kind of odd? But he is. He's the Lion from the tribe of Judah. He's the Lamb of God that takes the sins of the world. That's the way Scripture speaks. So we have to speak how Scripture speaks. Then look what it says in chapter 4 of Matthew. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, why was he led up in the Spirit in the wilderness, Jacob? Because in chapter 3, he went through his baptism. He's baptized. He goes in the water. It's revealed to John the Baptist that this is the Messiah. This is the one. Now, look what he says in verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Brother Dan, when you're hungry, the devil will attack you. That's what it says. He fasted. He's a, he, he fasted. He was in the wilderness. He, now, now, men get hungry. Men get hungry, right? He's hungry. He fasted 40 days. You know, it's like the life of Moses. That's why when you deal with your Jewish friends, you take them to Matthew because just like Moses was in the wilderness there, his first trip was 40 years, the second trip was another 40 years, and the last year there was another 40 years there. This is a type of Jesus Christ, Moses, and now you have Jesus Christ here. And then look what he said in verse 4. But he answered said, It is written... Okay, let's go to verse 3. And when the tempter, that's the devil, that's the devil, came to him, he said, if thou be, when the devil deals with you, he'll always make your doubt. Because he knew who he was talking to. But that's, how, that's, how, that's what the devil does. That he, he's a doubter. You don't want to be a doubting Debbie. All right. No one wants to be a Karen. Why would you want to be a doubting Debbie? But that's how sometimes we live. Oh, I can't do what the scripture says. Oh, he was God. It, it's easy to make it easy. But really, in some things, it, there's a life of discipline here. 
And this is Jesus Christ, our example now. Verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Now, did the devil ask him to do something bad? Aaron, no, because he knew that he was hungry. Was it hard for him, him being who he was, to turn rocks into bread to eat? No, he could if he wanted to. But why does he do it? Because we're not turning rocks into bread. For him, he could. But that's an advantage to him. Now, he's confronting the devil, not from the divinity, but from the humanity. And the first thing he says is that man shall live from every word from this book. This book is lie if you are hungry. And if you have a hunger, this world, word will satisfy you. Look at the next thing. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sits him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. At his written, he shall give his angels, con con angels charge concerning thee. And if thy hand, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash his foot against a stone. He uses the Bible, Dylan. He takes a passage in the book of Psalms and he quotes it to Jesus Christ. He says, if you are the son of God, climb the pinnacle of the temple, you can jump off and before you hit the ground, an angel will catch you. He says, no, I'm not going to tempt God. So if Jesus doesn't tempt God, you shouldn't tempt God. You shouldn't go to places where you shouldn't belong. And if you don't know what God says, you shouldn't speak for God. If you don't know. Don't put God in a position where you're going to tempt him. You know who you are. If you've been born again, you're a child of the king. There's that, you know, I, I, I love it. I, I remember one time I was witnessing to this young man, and he told me, well, if God heals my daughter, I'll live for her. You know what? Your daughter's going to die and probably go to the place where the unforgiven go. The problem is not your daughter being the sick. The problem is that you have sin in your life. And the only way that God can do anything is by dealing with your sin. And he got mad at me. But it's the truth. You, God's not God because you pray for somebody and somebody receives a blessing on the behalf of your prayer. No, God is God when that person realizes, hey, he did something for me. And because he did something for me, it's reason enough for me to live for him for the rest of my life. Just because God touched you one time at this altar and one tear popped out your right eye is reason enough for you to live for God for the rest of your life with a wholeheartedly. Don't be making excuses because so-and-so didn't live for God or this person didn't live for God or my grandma didn't live for God. You live for God not because of grandma, mom, dad, nephew, uncle, brother, Nava. You live for God because of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus did it in your life. Because Jesus is your Lord and Savior. This can't be friend. He's not my friend. He's Lord and Savior. Then Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil takes him up, exceeding high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to unto him. Isn't that wonderful? Here is the Savior now. 
Now, Dahlia, he, the devil could do that. He said, I'll give you the world if you bow down and worship me. Well, how did the devil get the world? It's because of Adam's sin. Adam sinned, and when Adam, he lost the world. Now, Adam wasn't the god of this world. No, the god was up there. But because God put him in charge and he lost the world, that's why you walk according to the course of this world. You walk according to the course of the devil. That's why I tell you, you if you don't have the Holy Ghost, then you got spooky ghost in you. Because that's what it says in Scripture. Now, I know it doesn't use the word spooky, but you got the walking, and that's why it's odd when you have tasted God and you know that he's good and you still want to continue to walk in the world. If you walk in the world, you're going to suffer the consequences of the world. Oh, if you could get this in your brain. That's why I get so upset with some people because it's, it's just like your nose is on your face and you see it in the mirror. That's how it is living for God. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, we have trials. Yes, everything could be dark. But at the same time, we got a God up in heaven that knows how to part the Red Sea, that knows how to bring shade when it's sunny, and knows how to feed you according to the fruit of the tree that's in the eternal garden. Twelve manners of fruit that he gives to us while we live here on this planet, while we live for him and we come against the opposition of the enemy and yet we stay faithful because he was faithful when you live for God according to scripture and you live for God according to the examples in the scripture then you're going to taste the fruits of the spirit and you're going to have the relationship that you're searching for in your life it only happens if you're born again it has to happen inside now, let, let's finish this off. I know I can be long. Let's go to um, John. Let's finish it off. I'm going to read some verses here. You just follow me in your Bibles. Therefore, let's go to John chapter 3. I'm sorry. There was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that in the King James it says miracles, but also this word miracles can be tra translated signs. No one can do these signs. And it's just two perspectives. The Gospel of John is written to the church. And for us, they're miracles. But if we were dealing with the Jew, these would be signs to the Jews that this was the Messiah, that this is the one that Scripture promised. Now, they're signs. You know, um, hey, put your finger there. Let's, let's, let's open our Bibles. Go to Revelation. Why don't you see it again? Go to Revelation. I think I want chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant the things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it. That word signify, it's in the King James here. If you look up this word, actually this word means signs. He signified, he signs, signs. You know, pictures, when you're going down the freeway, you know the billboards, those are signs. And they're describing something. Sometimes when you go out of state and you, you visit a state, sometimes the state will put a sign with attractions they have in that state. You know, if you go to Vegas, now they have a sign, and they put the Raiders because they have the Raiders. And so they want you to go to Vegas to go see the Raiders. It's because if you follow the Raiders, you say, hey, that's a pretty good trip right there. I'm going to go see the Raiders. Because there's a sign here that tells me that I could see the Raiders here. There's signs, and that's what scripture is. Sometimes scriptures are just pictures. There's nothing mystical about it. 
It's a sign. Haven't you ever read a sign? Do not enter. Enter. These are signs. Get that in your... Man, my head is hard. Did you hear that? <laughs> hear it! Sign. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his second time into his mother's womb and be born? One is spiritual. Jesus is saying what? You must be born again. Monty, but this guy, he's looking at from, how can I get into my mother's womb again? If you're looking at natural, you'll never enter into the kingdom of God. You got to see it from the perspective of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here. Nicodemus, you're a good guy. Nicodemus, you, you've done good things. But Nicodemus, you don't understand because you don't know the power of Scripture. If you only knew the power of Scripture, what I'm asking you to be born again is not to be born in the sense of uh, you being naturally born. You need to be spiritually born again. A change has to happen on the inside. Jesus on the inside, working on my outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on my outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Do you understand it? The change is not because I wear a tie. The change is because he changed my heart. He changed my heart. He came. He quickened me. He made me alive. He gave me the ability that I could make a choice for him. And that's what we're doing. We're preaching the good news of the kingdom. We're in the place of Jesus Christ on this earth telling people that they need to be reconciled to God. And the only way they can be reconciled to God is to be born again. Look at 5. Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Two elements you need in the new birth, Jacob. Water and spirit. Water and spirit. How hard is that? On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell down, it wasn't the apostles that said to them, this is what you got to do. It was the people that saw the signs that were happening said, men and brethren, what must we do? Now, Peter, on that day, Dahlia, he didn't point to the thief on the cross. But if you deal with people today, they'll tell you, well, the thief on the cross. No, he didn't say that. Well, he didn't say either John 3, 16. He didn't go, for God so loved the world. No, he didn't. Adam, you know what he said? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you that means everybody just like all have sin every one of you in the name jesus christ for the not forget it says remission of sins the releasing of them and then what happened and then god would give you what the gift of the holy ghost what that's what he said now, this is stop here. Jesus said, I need two elements in my life to experience a new birth, water and spirit. Repentance and baptism is one word. They go together. It's like Daniel and Jenny. 
They're not apart, they're together because they're one. And it's the same way. Repentance and baptism. Water and spirit. That's what it says. Look at look what he says here. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blower where it listens, and it hears the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born again. I don't know how it happens. All I know is if you're in a place where it's windy, there's a possibility you could leave here born again. And I think you're at a good place, not because I'm preaching, I'm loud, and I could be a loud-winded preacher. No, I think you're in a good place because the wind of God is here. And God could do a wonderful work in your life. And you could leave this building like that young girl that visited our church at one time and heard the voice of God and gave herself to Jesus Christ. You can make a commitment to Jesus Christ and follow him for the rest of your life and be a new creature in him. That is the new birth. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Don't be a doubting Debbie. Here's doubting Debbie. Don't ask how not, ask how. I want it. I want it. That's the question that should be in your mouth. Don't ask how does it, believe it. Look what he says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou art a master, a teacher of Israel, and know not these things. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak what we know and testify that what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And that's what wrong with people, because they try to understand it with their eyes, and we're talking about heaven. We're talking about heavenly place. It bothers me. You're talking about the word of God and that it gives life and you're telling them what God can do for them in the work of Jesus Christ and they still doubt. Oh, I don't know. I don't think that can happen for me. You know why? Because you haven't been born again. When you're born again, everything is possible. Everything is there. And if it's not, then maybe you weren't born again. You just need to come up here and ask God to Make me alive, quicken me, quicken me, make me alive. Look what he said. Very, very, I said to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you see not our witness. If I told you earthly things, you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Look what he says about himself. This is Jesus Christ. No man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. You explain that to me, Aaron. How can he be on earth and at the same time be in heaven and still be on earth? That means that Jesus Christ is more than just your average Joe. If he's here on earth and he's still in heaven and he's here on earth, that says that he's more, more than, than, than any religious leader in this world. Isn't that something that he, he has a foot here on earth and he has a foot in the heaven at the same time? And then look what he says right here. Listen what he says. Here's the sign. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's all stand. Last one's Isaiah. Last one's Isaiah. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Here's Jesus Christ. He goes through this wonderful discourse with Nicodemus. Then he gives him a sign. And the sign he gives them, Moses in the wilderness. Now, he gives him you that sign is because he's telling you there was the event that happened in the Old Testament. You know, Israel one day, 
they were, they were just living in the flesh. They were carnal. They were doing everything that was contrary to the law of Moses. And so what the Lord punished them was serpents. And serpents came out of everywhere, and they were biting them left and right. And people were dropping dead. So when the people saw that they had upset God and God had sent the serpents to bite them, God tells Moses, this is what you need to do. Get the carpenters, have them erect this image of a serpent on a pole, and if they want to be made well, have them look at the pole, the serpent on the pole. And if they look, they will be healed. Isn't that simple? Isn't that all oh God? He's not asking them for repentance. He's not asking for sacrifice. He's not asking them to do nothing but just look, look, look. How many people that day got bit by the serpent, the serpents, and didn't look at the serpent on the pole, but they were looking at the serpent on their arm. And instead of looking to be set free and delivered from the, the poison of the snake, they were just looking at the snake. Isn't that what you do when you come here? And you don't look at God and you leave here with your snakes? The snake is here. The one that Moses erected. All he's asking you is to look. But you look at the wrong things. You look at your marriage. You look at your children. You look at your husband. You look at your mom. You look at well, an accident that happened to you and you're disfigured or some way did something you bodily, you look at the snake instead of looking at the serpent. And this is what it says in Isaiah. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the earth of the earth, for I am God and there's no one else. And that's all God's asking you it's just to look. But you want to look at the snakes. Now you tell me who's crazy to leave this place with a snake on your arm or to look at the snake of heaven. Let's use this cross right here, that snake right there. Jesus died on that. I look towards that. When it's all said and done, I stand before God. I will not stand for it before him and go and explain the new birth. When I stand before him that day and he tells me why he should let me in, I'm going to open this book and say, because you said, and because you said, I looked. I looked! I looked! And those snakes that I was lifting up fell off. And now I just see the Lamb of God in heaven. That's the new birth. That's what you need inside. You can't do it on your own. It's not reformation. It's transformation. And if you want that, you can have that today. The altar's open. I know I was long, but this is such an important subject. Even us that have been born again, we need to understand that God did something inside our lives. So there's a place here for you in this altar. Won't you come and pray? Won't you come and just seek the Lord? And while you're down here, I will minister to you with the laying on of hands.